Lord, these are such good words as we express together our confidence in you that because of your love for us, you will hold us fast. Because of your commitment to your own glory, you will not go back on your word. You will not revoke your promise. You will not retract your Holy Spirit who indwells us. But you will secure our hope. You will bring us to sight while our faith is tested and tried and refined here by various trials, it will one day yield to face-to-face exposure to you, to revel in your glory, to have that which you have in store for us outweigh all the difficulties here, far beyond comparison. We thank you that you love us, that you have loved us first, that you have shed abroad your love in our hearts by your Holy Spirit whom you've given us. We pray, O oh God, as we reflect on your love for us, that it would work its way out in our lives to love toward one another. We ask that you would use your word this morning even to that end for your glory, for the building up of your church, and for our good. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. This is a great time for us to be in Romans 12, looking at body life. What does it look like for us as individuals, members of one another, in interdependent relationship, to care for one another, to be cared for by one another? You this morning who are suffering, you don't know what an encouragement you are to others. As you endure, you are a walking testimony that the words we just sang are true, that he will hold us fast. And as God sustains you as you suffer, God is using your suffering, your trials, your refinement for the growth of the church as a whole and for the benefit of others. This body life is so critical to the way God has designed and organized the church. We're not individuals on a rogue mission to glorify God somehow, but we are connected to one another by God's design, dependent on one another. We need each other. And this has been a season of ongoing trial in the life of this church from a slew of new cancer diagnoses to those who are awaiting a diagnosis over mysterious ailments and health issues. Some in our body are plagued by ongoing and difficult relationships and family estrangements. And of course, we think of our friends in Papua New Guinea on the other side of the world, laboring moment by moment, day by day, in difficult tasks, without the benefit of this body life, (laughs) laboring for the cause of the gospel so that others may hear and believe. This is such a good portion of our Bibles to be in together this morning. We've learned in Romans 12 so far that there is one reasonable response to the outpouring of God's mercy for us in the gospel. And that one reasonable response is your whole life lived in sacrificial service to God. Romans 12, 1. This is the life lived under the reign of grace. And we learn in verse 2 how crucial it is that we not be squeezed into the shape of this world, those external pressures daily imposed upon us to squeeze us into the mold, to think like the world, look like the world, act like the world around us. This radical renewal of thinking is to produce a profound humility in each of us. To have our minds renewed daily by the word of God ought to, in verse 3, cause us to think not more highly of ourselves than we ought, but to be sober about our self-assessment. And we learn in verses 4 through 8 that the Christian life is not lived alone. Rather, we're placed by God into these interdependent relationships with each other, with Christians, in a community called the local church. We are members of one another, each of us gifted by God and placed for the benefit of others and for the growth of the whole. 
And in this next section, Romans 12, 9 to 13, Paul turns his attention to some specific directives for this body life in the local church. How are we supposed to interact with each other? What are the house rules for our living together? I grew up with house rules. I don't know if you grew up with house rules. I still remember some of them. No whining, no crying, no fooling around, no coloring on the walls. Not sure exactly why that one was instigated. No talking while others were talking. In my household, these rules had numbers, and, and my dad merely had to put up a hand with the number five, and I knew that I was interrupting a conversation, and I needed to patiently wait. These things were important for the household, for me to live in freedom and joy and the love expressed in my home. These were helpful guidelines for me to be a benefit to others in my home and not be an annoyance, a nuisance, or one who caused the repeated repainting of walls. These were important directives. God in his kindness to the church has given specific directives to how his people are to interact with each other. In the context of the local church, and he'll go on in Romans 12 to talk about how the church collectively is to interact with society on the outside. How do we relate to those who persecute? How do we relate to governing authorities? All of these are on display in this chapter. But what's in display in verses 9 to 13 are particularly directives for how we relate to one another as believers in the context of the local church. And so Paul gives us 13 directives for life together. And we're going to look at just three this morning. We'll be in Romans uh, chapter 12 and verse 9. But let's read the list together as we begin. Paul writes in verse 9, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Now, all of these commands, while not strictly grammatically in command form, they're not imperatives here, they do function as commands. Uh, they all have, uh, interestingly, a, a continual aspect to them that stresses the duration of obedience to these things. It is as if Paul is saying, always be doing these things. What should characterize life in our Father's house? What should characterize life in the body of Christ? Always be loving without hypocrisy. Always be about abhorring what is evil. Always be clinging to what is good, etc. There is a durative, continual aspect, not a single act of obedience in store here, but a continual lifestyle of following these directives. In Ephesians 4, 16, Paul tells us how the body or the church grows. And the church grows contingent on two significant features. Of course, Jesus is the one who gives it the growth. Jesus gifts to the church, pastors, leaders, etc., who equip saints for the work of the ministry. But in Ephesians 4, 16, it is the body that causes the growth of the body. The church causes church growth. The members interconnected to one another, and, and that is dependent on two features of our interconnectedness. Number one, we be vitally connected to one another. That the body causes the growth of the body at every joint of the supply. That is where you and I rub against each other, meet each other, are with each other, spend time with each other, are in interdependent relationship with each other. There is a spiritual vitality that God uses and employs to grow the whole body. And the second contingent feature of that in Ephesians 4.16 is according to the proper working of each individual part. You see, if we're not together or if individual parts of the body are not working properly, either of those two factors will stunt the growth of the whole. You must understand that when you read your Bible in the morning, when you devote time to the Lord in prayer, when you serve others in ways maybe nobody sees, you're never doing it alone. 
those things have impact on the rest of the body of Christ. Because the proper working of each individual part has an impact on others in the body of Christ. By the way, the the significant impact of when we neglect fellowship has impact on the body of Christ. It's never just about me. And what Paul lays out for us in Romans 12 are some significant features of the proper working of the individual parts, which contribute as we get together to the growth of the whole. So while in one sense, Paul's directives here are, how do I live the Christian life? They are also a recipe for the health of any given local church. For Paul here details what it is like for us to work properly as members in the body of Christ. And the first directive is this, simply to love genuinely. To love genuinely. This is the first phrase in Romans 12, 9. Let love be without hypocrisy, the New American Standard says. And again, it's appropriate to sort of turn this into a command and, and let it feel like a command. It carries that flavor. The words are actually very short. Love, unhypocritical. Or let love be without hypocrisy. And the love that is described here is uh, a Greek word that perhaps you're familiar with. It has become very familiar in Christian context. It is the noun agape. You have perhaps heard this word. It, it might not be rare in our context, but it was rare in Greek literature. In fact, it is hard to find a single example of the noun agape in ancient Greek literature. It does show up 19 times in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. But it is everywhere in the New Testament. Over 120 times this noun shows up in the New Testament. And 75 times alone in the writings of the Apostle Paul. That is so unique because it captures a unique brand of love that was in every sense foreign to ancient Greek culture. And so it seems that the Apostle Paul and the New Testament writers, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, selected a word that existed in Greek language but really had nothing attached to it of any significance in order to convey a very unique brand of love the ancient world knew nothing of. This, of course, is God's love. And while it would be too much to say that the New Testament invented this word, it would be accurate to say that the New Testament writers took hold of this word to describe something so unique that it could only be that love that comes from God, the kind of love that God exhibits towards us and the kind of love that we are to have for one another. Listen to this love on display, same word, the agape love in Ephesians 2. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Do you understand the love that is described there? It comes from God. It takes the initiative. It finds us at our worst and then gives and gives and gives forever into eternity. This agape love from God is not, hey, I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. It is not a give and take kind of love. It is not a deal-making kind of love. It is an infinitely costly and freely given one directional love. The world doesn't have that kind of love. That kind of love comes from God. But that kind of love shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, Romans 5, is the kind of love that then flows through our lives into the lives of others. 1 John 4 says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And by this, the love of God was manifested in us that God sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son 
to be the propitiation for our sins. Listen, do you understand? God's love was not mere sentimentality. God's love was just not looking down on pitiable creatures and feeling sorry for them. It was not the kind of affection that's stirred up by something beautiful, something you long for, something you wish you could have. This kind of love was not something that was making deals, some arrangement, some uh, covenant to bargain for favors. God sent the son of his love, his only begotten, to be the propitiation for our sins. We were God's enemies. We had sinned against God by nature and by deed. And God sent his own son to be a propitiation, that is, a substitute sacrifice that satisfies wrath. A substitute sacrifice that satisfies wrath. That's a propitiation. The son of God by dying on a cross and enduring God's wrath against believers' sin, actually pays for those sins and appeases the just anger of God against those sins. This is infinitely costly love. The infinite person, the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, paid for our crimes. And he did so when we were at our worst, Not when we had cleaned ourselves up, not when we had made promises to God in some foxhole crisis. God, I'll do this if you just get me out of this. But God initiated. God did all that was required unilaterally, unconditionally to secure eternal salvation for those he set his love on. 1 John 4, 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. The kind of love that God has on display, the kind of love that begins in inter-Trinitarian selfless abandon and works its way out into salvific love for sinners, then works its way out in our lives into the lives of others. And you know this section in 1 Corinthians 13, A description of love, tangible expressions of what love is like. Listen to this. Love is patient, 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Patient. An ability to endure up under affliction. Love is kind. Love is kind. Love is kind in the face of Adversity. Listen, it's easy to have warm, fond affections for someone who's giving you everything you ever want all the time. For someone who's rendering you props. But love is kind when mistreated. Love is not jealous. Love is not coveting and envying and uh, performing the idolatries of wanting something that someone else has or wanting something that God has chosen to withhold. Love does not brag. Why? Because love is self-emptying, not consumed with self and propping self up. Love is not arrogant. Love does not act unbecomingly. Love does not seek its own. Love is not provoked by a provocation. Love does not take into account wrong suffered. Love doesn't keep lists. Love does not engender bitterness. Love does not rehearse hurts. 1 Corinthians 13, 6. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Similar to the, what is said in Romans twelve nine, Love without hypocrisy abhors evil and clings to good. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. There's no expiration date on this agape love, this God-originating, unilateral, unconditional, self-emptying love. It never fails. It doesn't run out. This kind of love is selfless. It expects no return. It takes the lead on giving. 
and it is given freely without condition or regret. This love is not the love of mutual indulgence, right? We negotiate with some partner so that we both get what we want. This is not give and take love. This is give and give and give and give love. This is the kind of love given to us freely and at infinite cost by God in the gospel. And this is the kind of love that we are to render to others. Charles Hodge said, it is a particular characteristic of the gospel that it turns the heart toward others and away from our own interests. This is what the gospel of God in his love for us does in us. We turn away from ourselves and we turn to others. And Paul's command here in Romans 12, 9 is to let love be without hypocrisy. Without hypocrisy. And the Greek, here, Greek word here for without hypocrisy is without hypocrisy. The hypocrite, uh, the Hippocrates, was the stage actor in ancient Greece. He wore a mask. For entertainment, he pretended to be something he wasn't. And everybody knew the stage was a sham and the actor a deceiver. And it didn't necessarily have a negative connotation. His job was to give a message or to entertain the masses by wearing a mask and being something other than he was on the inside. Of course, in later Greek, this Hippocrates came to refer to someone wearing a metaphorical mask, someone acting on the outside contrary to his intentions on the inside. And on the lips of Jesus, this word always had a negative connotation. I want you to turn to Mark chapter 12 and see one of the instances of Jesus' use of this word hypocrite. Mark 12, beginning in verse 13. They sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to him in order to trap him in a statement. So you have religious leaders and political leaders trying to trap Jesus. They came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and you defer to no one, for you're not partial to any, but you teach the way of God in truth. It's a great introduction, isn't it? It's empty flattery. It is deception. Now, these words are true, but these are actors. And Jesus said so. They ask, is it lawful to pay a poll tax to Caesar or not? And it's a setup, it's a trick question. And they think they've got him. Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But Jesus, knowing their hypocrisy, knowing their play acting, he saw through the mask, said to them, Why are you testing me? Bring me a denarius to look at. They brought him one. He said to them, whose likeness and inscription? They said, Caesar's. And he said to them, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And he unmasked their trickery. He revealed their true motives. This word hypocrite entered the English language uh, much, much later, probably in the 1600s and carried with it that negative connotation. Not, not a positive statement of, hey, I got into the hypocrites guild and I got a part in the next week's play. <laughs> but it has the negative connotation of someone who is play acting for the purpose of deception. And it is wicked. And that is the way Paul portrays this here. Let love be without hypocrisy. Means to love without play acting. To love without the mask, to be sincere, to be genuine through and through. This, this love, this agape love from God in our lives is to shine forth in genuineness. One writer said that feigned love or pretend love is nothing other than disguised hate. John Calvin knew the human heart. He said, it is indeed difficult to express how ingenious almost all men are to pretend a love which they really have not, for they only deceive others, but also themselves while they persuade themselves 
that they are not loved amiss by them whom they not only neglect, but also slight. Calvin's saying, people think, hey, I'm loving these people. I've deceived them and I've deceived myself when I'm actually neglecting or even maligning them. Listen, to love unhypocritically means to love after the fashion of God's love for us, unilaterally, unconditionally, to not expect return. Let me love this person, and I know they'll return the favor someday. Or if they don't return the favor after all that I did for them, and now they're not loving me the way I want to be loved, I will be bitter. My friend, you never loved To love expecting return is not love. To love unhypocritically means to love not in words only. A current popular song says there are three words that are said too much and not enough. And then he doesn't say them. Implied is, I love you. Is that word overused? Yes, absolutely. Is that word underused? Yes, absolutely. To love only in words and not in deed is to put on a mask. And what a tragedy to put on a mask called agape while on the inside are other things going on. To have a polite external surface while underneath are scorn or judgmentalism or superiority in the heart. To feign love with ulterior motives. Or maybe even just to be condescending in our expressions of compassion. I love you as the superior loves an inferior. I'm looking down on you who are lower. And and hey, everybody, watch me have pity on this person because he's lower than me. And this goes back to Romans 12, 3. We ought not think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. After 11 chapters of the humbling doctrine of the gospel of Jesus Christ, be sober about your self-estimation. That we love unhypocritically when we love not for advantage, not for appearances, not to prop up our reputations. We're not to wear the mask of agape love while harboring on the inside selfish aims, evil intentions, or judgmental attitudes. Listen, life in the body of Christ ought to be a haven of unhypocritical agape love, a community of people radically different than the world around them, seen in particular in the way selfless love is expressed one to the other. And my friends, you you must be commended for God's grace in your life. This This is a convicting phrase, love without hypocrisy. But it would be wrong to overlook the ways God has done this mightily in this church. Where you have loved one another so well. If ever there was a place for the church to look different than the world, it is in this expression of genuine, self-emptying love. If you look up the world's definitions of love, you know, I looked at Merriam-Webster this week, and nine definitions of love, and one of them was just you, you, you got a zero in a tennis match, right? You just didn't score any points. They call that love. I'm not sure why. I'm not sure what that has to do with love. I don't feel loved when I'm not getting any points in a tennis match. But the range of definitions for love in the English language are anything from warm enthusiasm. I, I love ice cream. Fond affection for someone I don't really know but admire from a distance to romantic attraction, those ushy-gushy feelings that really make me feel great. I can talk about being in love, right? I'm not talking about self-emptying, abandon, get away from myself and live for the glory of God and the benefit of another unilaterally with nothing expected ever in return. (laughs) That's not what the world means by being in love. Really, they're talking about an arrangement, a negotiated deal where I'm looking for the person who can best satisfy my love for myself. Who can live up to that standard? That's the person that I'm going to spend time with. 
Of course, that person's looking for the same thing, and so we've got to negotiate a truce or a deal, a a give and take, where I'm willing to sacrifice some of the things I might expect for my self-love so that you can get some of the things you expect for your self-love, and we just sort of negotiate this deal to live together. That's the world's view of love. How different must the church be? How different can the church be? when it lives in the kind of love that God alone produces. This directive, let love be without hypocrisy, is something of a heading for the rest of the directives that follow. From abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, devoted to one another in brotherly affection, all the way down the list. And so that brings us to the second directive. Under the banner of love, hate what is evil. Second phrase in verse 9. The New American Standard translates it, abhor what is evil. This is a very strong word for abject detestation. It's not disconnected from love. These are back to back. there's There's a love verse and a hate verse, right? Don't be a hater is a mantra today. Here God says, be a hater of something in particular. True love is not passive about what is evil. True love is not neutral about what is evil. True love is not tolerant of what is evil. Evil is, in fact, the enemy of love. And we're not talking about people. I I know that people are evil by nature, but that's not the evil we're talking about hating here. We're talking about hating sin and the evil systems And you may be thinking, I thought that God is love. Didn't we just read that in 1 John 4? God is love. How how can God really hate anything? Aren't those absolutely opposite? You need to understand that God's hatred for that which is evil is actually an, an expression of his love for what is supremely good. And you need to understand this relationship. You can't say you love something while you simultaneously embrace the thing that destroys what you say you love. And God, committed to his own glory, is committed to a kind of love that rightfully despises that which is destructive to his glory and his purposes and his people. Listen to God's own testimony, Isaiah 114. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They become a burden to me and I'm weary of bearing them. There was religion that God hated. Isaiah 61, 8, I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery in the burnt offering. Again, an expression of God's hatred of the empty sham of religion that his people were entertaining. Jeremiah 12, 8, my inheritance has become to me like a lion in the forest. She has roared against me. Therefore, I have come to hate her. Jeremiah 44, 4, I sent you all my prophets, my servants, again and again saying, oh, do not do this abominable thing which I hate, speaking of idolatry. Hosea 9, 15, all their evil is at Gilgal. Indeed, I came to hate them there because of the wickedness of their deeds. I will drive them out of my house. And in verse 21 of Hosea 9, I hate, I reject your festivals. <clears throat> And in God's economy, God's ultimate hatred of sin will result in the rejection of people who do not turn from sin. You have to understand there is infinite love available in Jesus Christ for all who would come to God by faith. But there is only God's love for his glory, which is a love for justice which is expressed in holy hatred and holy wrath against all those who will reject the son of his love. Not only does God hate things in Scripture, but we are to hate things according to Scripture. R.C. Sproul said, sin is cosmic treason. We rarely take the time to think through the ramifications of our sin. We fail to realize even in the slightest sins we commit, such as little white lies and other peccadilloes, that we are violating the law of the creator of the universe. 
In the smallest sin, we defy God's right to rule and to reign over his creation. Instead, we seek to usurp for ourselves the authority and the power that belong properly to God. Even the slightest sin does violence to his holiness, to his glory, to his righteousness. Every sin, no matter how seemingly insignificant, is truly an act of treason against the cosmic king. And R.C. Sproul is right. We, we don't often think about our sin as something to hate with the vehemence with which God hates sin. Exodus 18.21 gives instruction to God's people uh, in the days of Moses. You shall select out of all the people able men who fear God, men of truth, those who hate dishonest gain, and you shall place them as leaders. One of the qualifications for a leader under Mosaic law was that he hates dishonest gain. The psalmist in Psalm 119 wrote, From your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. A right appropriation of the truth of God results in the hatred of those things which contravene God's ways. Psalm 119, 113, I hate those who are double-minded, but I love your law. Verse 128, therefore, I esteem right all your precepts concerning everything. I hate every false way. Verse 163, I hate and despise falsehood, but I love your law. In Revelation 2, the church at Ephesus was commended because they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Nicolaitans were those who claimed to be Christians, had Christian doctrine, but married Christian doctrine with moral evil. They said, look, you can be a Christian and you can still live the way of the world. You want to have sexual immorality and still name Jesus as your savior? Great. That was Nicolaitan doctrine. And Jesus addressing the church at Ephesus said, you hate them. Good job. There are things Christians are supposed to hate. In fact, love without a hatred of evil is mere sentimentality. You're merely saying that you love something. And now this attitude requires a serious adjustment on our part. Think about what your life was like before you knew Christ. What did you consider evil? Maybe you didn't think anything was evil. Maybe you thought everything's good just as long as people are sincere. <laughs> Maybe you had categories of evil like the, you know, the Adolf Hitlers and the Pol Pots and the Joseph Stalins of the world. Maybe you had a category of evil for the one who cut you off in traffic or the one who cheated on his taxes when you paid yours. But outside of Christ, it's really difficult to come to grips with the fact that I am the problem. I am evil. And in coming to Christ, you discovered that you alone before God are answerable for your crimes and that you have committed this cosmic treason and that from your very nature, you're doing the things that displease God and destroy your own life. And anyone who has come to Christ has at some level come to grips with a singular ownership of evil, resident evil. And so as a Christian now in Christ with residual depravity that I will not be freed from until I am with Christ, I am to hate evil. And it begins, frankly, with what resides still in me. Do you find those things in you that are displeasing to your Savior? And are you learning to cultivate a holy hatred for them? That is the call here, to hate the evil in us, to hate the evil in the world around us, to hate those systems, those corruptions that destroy humanity and drag a mass of people to eternal destruction. It's appropriate to hate false teaching. It's appropriate to hate false systems. And it's appropriate to love those people under those systems with the love of the gospel. Listen, to obey God's command here to abhor what is evil means we dare not compromise with evil. We don't let a little bit in. We don't make deals with evil. We don't excuse evil. We dare not make room for evil. We should not be amused by evil, entertained by evil. Hating evil means getting our categories right. 
Before you were in Christ, you were left to your own selves, your own ideas, your own authority for deciding what is good and what is bad. And God's indictment against humanity is that we regularly call evil good and good evil. We get these things backwards, even though we can't eradicate from the human constitution an awareness that there are such things as good and evil. We get the categories wrong naturally. And so this not being squeezed into the mold of this world and being renewed in the spirit of our minds by the word of God and the truth of God is so critical because the love we are to live out amongst each other, with each other, and before a watching world has as one of its manifestations a hatred for evil. Notice that this word hate is a feeling word. It's a feeling word. I can't help how I feel. Well, you're you're supposed to. (laughs) Do you recognize that you are accountable for your internal affections? What you're affected by. You're accountable before God for what you feel and and what comes to mind. You, You must address before the Lord corrupt affections. Confess them to him. You say, well, I don't don't feel like reading my Bible this morning. I don't want to read my Bible unless it's purely out of love. I don't believe in duty. Well, you need to believe in duty. You need to confess wrong affections, and you need to read your Bible. And as you're doing that, say, God, I don't feel like reading my Bible. I admit it. (laughs) Help me. Boy, God loves to answer that prayer. We don't merely confess the outward manifestations, the deeds that, that flow from these affections, but we actually have to corral and contain and correct wrong affections and cultivate right ones. You realize you're accountable to God for how you feel. You have to be careful that we don't fall into the wrong idea that when you realize you've done something wrong, you only confess the outward action. Confess the affections. Listen, it's popular in our day to say things like this. Acting out of... uh, I'll avoid this specific illustration. Acting out of aberrant behavior is wrong, but feeling attracted to it, that's just who we are. And, and, and wrong attractions are excused. Well, they're not excused biblically. This is a, a feeling word, an affection word, and we still have polluted affections and we must still be shepherds over our own hearts and deal with the corrupt fountain We often love the things that God hates and despise the things or neglect the things that God loves. This is residual depravity in the heart of each of us. And the command here is clear. We are to be haters, haters of evil. That leads to a third directive in the third phrase in verse 9. Cling to what is good. Cling to what is good. Some English versions say hold fast to or cleave to. The literal word here just means glue. Be glued to what is good. That's the word used in Matthew 19, 5. For this reason, a man will be joined to his wife. Or in Luke 10, 11, the dust that clings to the feet. Uh, if you've ever had to do uh, work in the dirt in your backyard here in Arizona, especially when it's wet, you've run into our wonderful clay that sticks to everything. It clings to the bottoms of shoes. Here we are directed to cling to the good. While in the middle of verse 9, we're told to have the highest degree of hatred for what is evil, we are here told to have the highest degree of persevering stickiness to what is good. And this is what is intrinsically good, and what is good by God's definitions and God's categories. What does it mean to cling to what is good? It, It means you have to put in your life a regular pattern of knowing what is good. We read it this morning in Psalm 34, taste and see that Yahweh is good. Cling to him. The Holy Spirit has prepared for us good works for us to walk in. Grace teaches us to deny ungodliness and to walk in these things that are good. Cling to these things that are good. The word of God is good like honeycomb, sweet to the taste and profitable. Cling to that. Later in Romans, Paul is going to tell us that believers are full of goodness. Cling to them. Even identify evidences of God's work in a life that produces such goodness. It's the only way any of us have any of it. 
if you're on a regular pattern of avoiding what is good, you will see a direct line to the shaping of your life after what is evil, a normalizing of what is evil, a comfort with what is evil, a making deals with what is evil, an excusing of what is evil. These things are mutually exclusive. Love without hypocrisy is a kind of love that produces in us as individuals and in us corporately as a body of believers, hatred for evil and clinging to good. Listen to Paul's instructions in Philippians 4.8. Brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Take your brain and cause it to take up residence in these things. Dwell there. Live there. Abide there. What does it mean to cling to what is good? What would it look like to cling to what is good in your life? I want us to consider for a few moments the effect of these three directives in any local body of believers. A local church where the gospel is known and loved and embraced and understood and proclaimed. And then this unhypocritical love is lived out. What would that look like before a watching world? What would you and I experience to the degree that that is true? Unhypocritical love, a hatred for evil, and a clinging to good. (laughs) What kind of body of believers would that look like? By God's grace, in, in great measure, it would look like what this body of believers looks like and has lived out. And yet, for us, no doubt, there is room to grow, room to excel still more in this love. No greater way for us to grow in the love of God towards each other than to be together, reflecting on the love of God for us in Christ. That ought to be the regular habit and pattern. If you're not in a small group, in a disciplined way, regularly participating in these things, reflecting on the glory of God and the love of God for us in the gospel, and then spilling out all over each other in real life, I want to encourage you, be in a small group. Be involved in the various ministries of the church. The Sunday mornings can't provide the vehicle for all that the New Testament requires for us believers to live out body life together. We must be together more. We must reflect on God's truth more. We must serve more. Uh, And there is more to come in Romans 12. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your love. We cling to this truth that you will hold us fast, not because we could hold on to you, but because in your ineffable grace, you have set your love and your affections on us and you keep us. God, may we cling to you. May we cling to what is good. May we love what you love and despise what you despise. God, we know we don't have in ourselves the inexhaustible stores of selfless, self-emptying, others-focused, others-benefiting love like you do. Oh, how we need you. And God, we ask now, even as a church, that you would continue to pour out your love in us, that it would reverberate, overflow into each other's lives. For your glory, in Jesus' name, amen.